Hi, I'm Bake Me Berserker and welcome to the fifth episode of my Let's Roll series, which focuses on the generation and progression of each Beck Me Dungeons and Dragons character class. If you don't know what Beck Me is, I strongly recommend you watch my Beck Me playlist, where I dive into many aspects of the game and make the case for why I think it's the greatest version of the Dungeons and Dragons game. Before I continue with exploring the generation of a Beck Me dwarf, I also recommend those unfamiliar with Beck Me to watch the previous episodes in this series, especially the fighter video, as some of the mechanics mentioned here are explained in more depth in that video, specifically the fighter combat options which a dwarf has access to. As I roll up a dwarf, I will explore the character class as presented in the rules cyclopedia, released in 1991. Once generated, we'll go up the levels to examine how the class has progressed and what's changed. As I'm using the rules cyclopedia, I will be including the skills rules and the weapon mastery rules. Today we're looking at generating the fifth character class we come across in the rules, and that is the Dwarf. The Dwarf is the first of three Demihuman classes available to play in the core Beckme Dungeons and Dragons rules. We are told that Demihumans are referred to as such because they are similar to humans. In addition, we are told that Demihuman characters are less common than human ones, due to them being reclusive and mysterious so a vastly different take on playing a non-human than in later editions of the game. Indeed, if you followed the rules as written, being able to play a demi-human could be quite difficult. Because one must roll 3d6 for each ability score in order, combining this with the fact that demi-humans have a minimum requirement for certain ability scores, then you could only play a demi-human if you satisfy this requirement. Of course, this was heavily house-ruled, even back in Beckme's heyday, because people wanted to be able to choose what they wanted to play. However, this had the effect of making demi-humans less mysterious and more common as adventurers. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I like the choice, but I also like the mystique. What do you think? What I need to mention here is that the playing of a demi-human in Beckme uses the race as class system, meaning that if you play a dwarf, then that is your class. You cannot be a dwarf thief or a dwarf magic user. You may only be a dwarf. This mechanic has come in for a lot of criticism, and is one of the key reasons that this edition of D&D has suffered from the moniker of Basic, when advanced Dungeons & Dragons had less limitations in this regard. But the best defence of Racer's class as a system that I've come across is that Demihumans are pretty much alien to human. They do not conceive things in the same way, or share the human worldview. So whilst such a lack of diversity of options might seem restrictive to humans, to demi-humans, it's just the way it's always been. That said, as Beckme developed, options to expand beyond the rules as written to offer demi-humans some variety were also developed. The most notable of these are within the Gazetteer series, and there's a great option to become a dwarf cleric in the Gazetteer, centering on this race that I have done a review on, linked on the screen and in the description. Right, let's get back to rolling a dwarf. We are told that a dwarf is short and stocky at around four feet tall, Male dwarves typically have long beards. Their skin colour is typically ruddy or earth-coloured, and their hair is commonly of a dark colour. The core rules also state that they can also live to around 400 years old. Dwarves are stubborn but practical creatures, and they value craftsmanship and gold. They are good fighters and also quite resistant to magic. Dwarves typically take on a fighter-type role, and are able to use any weapon that is not in the large category, and they can wear any armour and use a shield. In fact, if you wanted to look at the class in a purely mechanical way, they are basically a fighter with better saving throws, but with some special dwarven abilities added in. This means dwarves have access to the same special fighting options at first level that fighters do, such as setting a spear to receive a charge, and using a lance from horseback, both of which have the potential to do double damage. However, dwarves gain more combat options from 12th level as opposed to 9th level for fighters. To balance the power of a dwarf, the class is restricted to a maximum 12th level, although they may rise up in what's called attack ranks beyond this, gaining some attack options and resistances, but not gaining any more hit points or saving throw improvements. There are variant rules in the rules cyclopedia that allow for doing away with this maximum level rule, but for the purpose of this video I'm sticking with the core rules. High-level dwarves have the potential to become extremely resistant to magic, automatically taking half damage from spells or spell-like effects, and only taking quarter damage on a successful save. Dwarven special abilities include Infravision, which is a way of seeing heat sources in the dark up to 60 feet, and Detection, 
allowing dwarves to find some types of traps, sliding walls, sloping corridors, and new constructions. I'll cover these a bit later in the video. Dwarves are organized socially into clans, and at the center of each clan is their dwarven relic, the Forge of Power, which can aid in magical item creation. Well, that's the basics of a dwarf when starting at first level. So, let's roll. Here's the front of my character sheet. Let's stick the important information about a dwarf on the right here, so that we can refer to it as needed. Apologies for the shading here. The information was separated in two parts of the page, and my camera really picked out the difference in light. Moving on, I must first ensure that my roles allow me to be a dwarf in the first place, so my character's constitution score must be 9 or above. We are also told that the dwarf's prime requisite is strength, so I would want to ensure that score is my highest to maximise the amount of experience points my character earns, as well as ensuring my dwarf is effective in combat. Right, let's put the dungeon master's name here and the class and level we're going to demonstrate. As we're looking at the dwarf today, we can assume that the scores I rolled favoured that class, like so. I'm not going to adjust these scores any further using the rules for doing this, which I explain in earlier videos. I'm liking that high wisdom and I'll explain why in a bit. Okay, so now it's time to work out the bonus or penalty adjustment for each ability score. Let's get that chart on the screen. Okay, so I get plus two adjustment for my strength, but my adjustment for my intelligence is zero. Looking at my wisdom score, I get a plus two, and I get a plus one for my dexterity and a plus one for my constitution. Both of these will come in handy in combat, as dexterity will help me avoid attacks and constitution will increase my hit points. As for my charisma, I get no adjustment here. My dwarf is not a standout personality, but he's kind of a dependable guy. You know, you might not notice he's around until you see an axe head swinging in your direction. Each of these adjustments will affect my character's interaction with the world, as described by the highlighted text. We won't go too much into these unless they specifically impact my dwarf's generation, but I will immediately change my dwarf's armor class, as that dexterity score of 13 will reduce it, which is a good thing, from a natural armor class of 9 to 8. Right, so my dwarf is shaping up really nicely, but how many hit points do they start with? Well, looking at the information in my table, a dwarf's hit dice is 1d8. Going strictly by the Beckme rules, a character may not get maximum hit points at first level, so I roll my 1d8 and get almost maximum, a 7. I add 1 to this roll because of my constitution adjustment, making my actual hit point total 8. Let's insert that number into the hit points box here. The next thing I need to do is add my dwarf's saving throws to this sheet. In Beckme, saving throws are determined by class, as shown on this table. So all we need to do is transfer the numbers for level 1 onto my sheet. So death ray or poison is 8. Magic Wands is 9, Paralysis or Turn to Stone is 10, Dragon Breath is 13, and Rod Staff or Spell is 12. So if you've been working your way through this Let's Roll series, you can see that a Dwarf's saving throw scores are significantly lower than the other classes at first level. And remember I kept my Wisdom score at 16 instead of adjusting my ability scores? Well, Wisdom offers an adjustment to Spell saving throws, so where my saving throw versus spells is currently 12, my plus 2 wisdom bonus would mean I would actually only need to roll a 10, meaning at first level my dwarf has a 55% chance to save versus any spell that allows a save. That's pretty powerful stuff. Let's now turn to languages. As I mentioned in my previous Let's Roll videos, each character starts with at least some understanding of what's referred to as the common tongue. As you can see on this languages table, due to my dwarf having an intelligence of 9, you might presume that they have just two languages. The first two of these will be common and my dwarf's alignment tongue, which I will elect to be lawful. However, we are told that dwarves are able to speak a number of languages in addition to these. Specifically, these are the dwarf tongue, of course, and then gnome, goblin, and kobold. It's a shame my dwarf doesn't have a great charisma score, so that I might have more of an advantage when communicating with creatures speaking these languages. Let's put all these languages on the sheet, as well as my dwarf's alignment of lawful. Right, so my dwarf is almost there in terms of this front half of the sheet. The combat section at the bottom is the same for all starting character classes, and just relates to the number needed to hit a particular armor class. But my dwarf has a plus two strength adjustment to hit in melee combat, and a plus one adjustment to hit with a missile weapon. Let's amend this hit roll table to account for this. 
Of course, these numbers may be further impacted by magic or weapon mastery adjustments. OK, so now it's time to give my dwarf a name. Let's use the one from the basic red box when introducing new players to this class, and call this dwarf Rolf, together with the portrait offered in that set. There you go, meet Rolf, a curious dwarf that has ventured beyond the safety of his people's caves and underground cities. His taciturn clan members think he's mad to go out into the blue, seeking answers to things best left to the immortals. Rolf is the black sheep of the family, never able to sit still and always looking under another rock that his family elders say should be left alone. So let's call this dwarf Rolf the Restless. He's got his helmet on, not least to withstand the inevitable back chat he receives every time he returns home, but he knows it for what it is. Jealousy. He knows his people wish they shared his wanderlust and they just can't bring themselves to leave their cold, dark, protective caves. OK, Rolf the Restless is shaping up to be an interesting dwarf. Now it's time to turn over the sheet and insert some further details. Specifically, information regarding Rolf's dwarf abilities, skills, and weapon mastery details. Let's first look at dwarf abilities. As I mentioned earlier, all dwarves gain access to fighter combat options, and at first level, this only includes the set spear versus charge, and lance attack manoeuvres. In order to avoid too much duplication in these videos, I won't repeat the detail of these manoeuvres here, but I do a deep dive into these in my Let's Roll a Fighter video, so check that out if you haven't already. An additional ability the dwarf has is the ability to see in the dark. This is called infravision, and a dwarf has this to a range of 60 feet. Infravision only works in complete darkness, and is rendered useless in the presence of both normal and magical light. Infravision causes warm things to be seen as red, and cold things to be seen as blue. This can include recent footprints. That said, infravision does allow a character to discern things that are the same temperature as the environment. Infravision does not allow for the reading of text. A light source is needed for that. Also, a creature with infravision would need to be within 10 feet of an individual for them to be recognisable, unless otherwise easily distinguishable. Clearly, Infravision has its limitations if played correctly. It's not a catch-all see-in-the-dark ability that may be employed in the presence of torch-wielding humans. Infravision is for delving in the deep dark places of the Earth, where carrying a torch might highlight you as a target. Get in, spot your mark, and get out. That would be my use of Infravision, before letting the stupid humans light them up and charge. In addition to Infravision, dwarves have the Detection ability. What this means is that dwarves are able to detect traps, among other things. Well, certain kinds of stone traps, and not the intricate traps that only a thief might spot. What we're told is that these traps might be built into stonework or heavy construction, so I would determine this to mean the classic shrinking room trap, or collapsing floor or ceiling. As well as being able to detect traps like these, dwarves may spot sliding walls, which are not the same as secret doors, and also sloping corridors, so a dwarf can tell if they're on an incline or not. And also new constructions, which I rule to be some form of rudimentary date stamping of how old a construction is, as the meaning of new can be quite ambiguous. To take advantage of this detection ability, a dwarf must succeed at getting one or two on a d6. Also, this detection action is not automatic, and a player must inform the dungeon master what they are trying to detect. They can't just say they're trying to detect anything, this means that the player must be engaging with the description of the environment, and participating in the game. We'll come back to these abilities later as Rolf gains more fighter combat options at 12th level. For now, let's move on to skills. Each character starts with a minimum of 4 skills, plus a character's intelligence adjustment. Rolf's intelligence adjustment is 0, so he starts with the standard 4. An extra skill slot is gained at 5th and 9th level and then is dependent on how many experience points a dwarf has as he climbs beyond 12th level. We'll see how this plays out as Rolf develops. In the meantime, he chooses Craft Armor, Craft Weapons, Healing, and Storytelling, and we'll record these on the sheet along with their relevant ability score values, which must be rolled equal to or under to succeed in a skill check. OK, now it's time to jump into Weapon Mastery. Weapon Mastery acquisition is a little different for demi-humans compared to humans. We are told that demi-humans have a basic knowledge of all weapons from first level, meaning they are not treated as being unskilled in any weapon. This is due to their longer lifespans and wilderness-oriented lifestyles. 
However, demi-humans may attempt to gain weapon mastery of any weapon they have a basic knowledge of at 4th, 8th and, for dwarves, 12th level, as shown in this table. Also, demi-humans can continue to accumulate weapon mastery knowledge beyond their maximum level by getting one more attempt for every 200,000 experience points beyond their maximum level. As he is only first level, and to keep things simple, I will only enter the weapons Rolf is carrying, rather than listing every weapon he has a basic mastery of. Rolf is a particularly dwarfy dwarf, so he carries a battle axe, a light crossbow, and a hand axe. We'll record these in the weapon mastery section here, along with the stats associated with just having a basic skill. As you can see here, Rolf may attempt to improve his mastery with these weapons every 4th level up to 12th, and then after every 200,000 XP he earns. We'll see how access to more weapon mastery improves Rolf's effectiveness later in the video. I'm not going to delve into equipping my character or determining their wealth, as it won't really add to the information I'm trying to relay here. So, this is Rolf the Restless, our first level dwarf. Rolf leaves his clan in the mountains of Rockholm and strikes for human lands, where adventure is welcomed and riches may be won. He falls in with a number of trusty individuals and grows in ability and renown. Despite this, he often feels the call of his homeland, but knows that his family just won't understand the kind of life he's chosen. For now, Rolf lives in a modest home in the Strong Hollow quarter of Highforge, safe within the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. Whenever Rolf feels a little homesick, he can be heard muttering the words, These are my people, and this is my crowd. So, Rolf sits smoking a pipe in the corner of a Highforge inn. The conversation around him goes over his head, literally, as he daydreams about his recent adventures. Rolf the Restless currently has 2,600,000 experience points, and is now level 12, and his attack rank is M. He is at the pinnacle of dwarven power, but his wanderlust is too great to start a clan of his own. He is in fact well on the path to immortality, and looking forward to learning what's beyond the veil. Let's have a look at Rolf's character sheet to see what's changed. First, let's look at his saving throws. As Rolf is now 12th level, we can refer to the correct numbers on this table, and copy them to the sheet, like so. One thing to remember here is that Dwarves' saving throw scores do not improve past 12th level, so this is as good as it's gonna get for Rolf. That said, a human character has to wait until well past 20th level to get anywhere near these kinds of scores, so the resistances of a Dwarf really shine through here. Sure, humans do have the potential to be as low as 2 in all of these scores by 36th level, but this is rarely achieved as much as reaching 12th level, for obvious reasons. Okay, so let's move on to the hit roll chart. We'll consult the numbers appropriate to Rolf's level and update them on the sheet. What you must understand here is that demi-humans use the fighter attack rolls up to their maximum level. The DH column here referring to demi-humans is their progression beyond maximum level and into their attack ranks. Rolf is 12th level with a maximum attack rank of M, so his Thacko becomes the equivalent of a 25th level fighter and drops to 2 for both melee and missile combat when taking his ability adjustments into consideration. Also, you will notice there is a dagger symbol next to some of these numbers. This just means that this amount is added to the damage of an attack if a natural one is not rolled. Let's transfer these numbers onto the character sheet like so. The last thing we need to update on this part of the character sheet is Rolf's hit points by consulting the dwarf's hit dice information again. As you can see, Rolf gets 1d8 hit points per level up to 9th level, and he may apply his constitution adjustment to this total. However, as he is now 12th level, he does not roll a hit dice for levels 10 to 12, and he also does not get any constitution adjustments for levels 10 to 12 either, instead only getting plus 3 hit points for every level above 9th. I roll 8d8 for Rolf, adding another 8 for 8 levels worth of constitution adjustments, getting a total of 58. Adding the 3 hit points for each level beyond 9th is a further 9 hit points, making 67. Adding this to Rolf's current 8 hit points makes a grand total of 75 hit points at 12th level. What's key to remember here is the wording when it comes to obtaining hit points. A dwarf gains plus 3 hit points per level from 10th. Well, a dwarf cannot gain any more levels past 12th, so this total of 75 hit points is it for Rolf. He will not gain any more for the rest of his career, barring some very powerful magic or a wish that might adjust his constitution score. So again, we're confronted with a matter of balance. For all the resistances and abilities a dwarf might have, a human class continues to gain hit points right up to the maximum of 36th level. 
For a fighter, that would mean gaining an extra 48 hit points. That's a big difference, but a player would need to consider whether they would prefer more resistance, meaning less likelihood of taking damage, or more hit points to absorb damage should it occur. The choice is, of course, yours. Regardless, Rolf now has 75 hit points and will add them to the sheet here. Now let's turn the character sheet over again and update the items there. Let's first focus on Rolf's fighter combat options. At 12th level, Rolf gained four more fighter combat options. These are Disarm, Parry, Smash and Multiple Attacks, which we'll record here. I won't go into the detail of these combat options in this video, as I already go into them in some depth in my Let's Roll a Fighter video, so I'm going to recommend again that you check that out if you haven't already. Otherwise, it's worth stating here that, due to being a dwarf, Rolf may not use the disarm action on any creature with the giant or gargantuan description. But as with all things in Beckme, it's up to the DM. I mean, there are some pretty big things that even a human shouldn't be able to disarm. In addition, when it comes to multiple attacks, Rolf gained a third attack per round when he obtained attack rank K. In addition to these fighter combat options, at attack rank G, Rolf's dwarven resistances improved to mean that he now only receives half damage from spells or spell-like effects, or quarter damage on a successful save. We'll make a note of that under his dwarf abilities and move on to the skills. Rolf gains another skill for levels 5 and 9, another at 1,200,000 experience points, and another at 2 million experience points, due to gaining a further 800,000 experience points. With Rolf's current XP total at attack rank M being 2,600,000, he will gain another skill slot after obtaining a further 200,000 XP. But for now, we have four more skill slots to add to Rolf's character sheet. I'm going to make this simple and just improve two of the ones he already has, specifically the crafting ones. Rolf is going to try to make some magical weapons and armor sometime in the future. Although the rules cyclopedia doesn't take crafting this far for dwarves, information about dwarven craft magic is contained within the Dwarves of Rockholm Gazetteer, link in the description. Rolf puts two slots each into his two craft scores. They're still not great scores, but he might just get lucky. If you have been watching my previous videos, you will see clearly that demi-humans do not obtain skills at the same level as humans, which in my opinion, demonstrates human versatility and dominance. I mean, Rolf has just eight skill slots with 2,600,000 XP. A fighter of the same intelligence would have 10, and a thief would have 11. Let's move on to weapon mastery. So according to this table, Rolf had three weapon mastery attempts by the time he reached 12th level, which required 660,000 experience points, and he gained an extra level of mastery for every 200,000 XP after that up to his current 2,600,000 XP, which is another nine attempts, meaning a total of 12 weapon mastery attempts we need to account for. Rolf has three weapons here, which for simplicity's sake, I'll say remain his favourite. So I'll say he's successful at all 12 attempts when becoming a Grand Master of the Battle Axe, Light Crossbow and Hand Axe. Let's insert those details now. For more information on what all these numbers mean, then I go into Weapon Mastery in more detail in my video on the Master Rules, link on the screen and in the description. So with that final update of Weapon Mastery, there you have it. Rolf the Restless, a 12th level attack rank M Wandering Dwarf of Rockholm. He may be smoking a pipe in a high forge inn for now, but this unassuming fellow is well on his way to immortality. Well, that's been the first episode of Let's Roll looking at a demi-human class. There's a good amount of crossover with the fighter, so apologies if it got muddy in parts. Like I've mentioned throughout this video, I strongly recommend watching the episode on the fighter for more information regarding combat options and weapon mastery. That said, generating this dwarf brought back a lot of memories about why this was always my favourite class a good warrior that didn't mind charging a magic user. It would be great to learn your own experiences of the Beckme Dwarf and how you think the class holds up, especially given its restriction to 12th level. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this fifth episode of Let's Roll. Please give it a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beckme Berserker. Keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.